over a, uh, a desire to really think about how we can push rural electric cooperatives uh, towards greater adoption of clean energy, energy efficiency, um, all of the good things that uh, we care about um, in the interest of both um, acting on climate change and uh, developing rural economies. So the coalition is uh, made up of seven groups and uh, we're organizations that represent and organize rural electric cooperative member owners in the five most carbon intensive generation and transmission co-ops in the country. So we have Partnership for Southern Equity from down in Georgia, um, Appalachian Voices, um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth and Mountain Association uh, from the Appalachian region, region um, Renew Missouri, um, who, uh, as the name suggests, are active in Missouri, <laughs> the Western Organization of Research Councils or Resource Councils, which is uh, a network of grassroots organizations across uh, seven states in the Mountain West and the Great Plains. And then CURE, we're a uh, grassroots uh, rural group in uh, Minnesota. And uh, we, the, these groups came together uh, kind of around the common work that we do around rural electric cooperatives and particularly around fostering energy democracy um, in electric co-ops in electric co-ops. Um, so I imagine many of you are pretty familiar with the uh, the story with the history of rural electrification but uh, I think it's always useful to kind of provide full context for um, our proposal and where we're going. So um, 50 years after the first electric grid in the United States, 90% of rural communities and rural farms still weren't electrified. Um, you know, this is because of kind of the, the problem with rural electrification that's still true today. It's uh, a high cost of uh, investment to uh, put up this infrastructure, a high cost to maintain uh, more infrastructure um, since you're serving a larger geography and fewer people to pay for that, um, that infrastructure. So that was a big barrier to uh, your investor owned utilities and private capital mobilizing um, in rural communities and, uh, and in farms across the country. Uh, however, um, you then had the New Deal and uh, uh, specifically the Rural Electrification Act of 1936, um, which made uh, federal capital available to communities to electrify themselves um, through the, uh, the cooperative uh, structure. And I think this is uh, really one of the most successful federal spending or social democratic programs in the country's history. So today, um, you know, those uh, in, in between uh, 1936 and 1950, um, we went from 10% of rural communities being electrified to more than 80% being electrified. So it happened at a very, very rapid pace, improved the lives and economies of uh, millions of people across the country. And uh, today what you see on your map is what the uh, rural electric system looks like today, serving 40 million people, uh, 42 million um, to be more precise uh, across the country. Um, and, uh, as we, uh, as <laughs> we all know, or should know, uh, every customer, every person buying their power from a co-op is a member owner, um, with an ownership stake in that, uh, in that utility and a right to vote in the annual elections. So a lot of the problems, as I said, previously with rural electrification still persists today. Electric co-ops serve 90% of federally recognized persistent poverty counties across the country. 
uh, you know, specifically that's home to many rural communities of color, particularly um, around the Black Belt in the Southeast and in uh, many uh, tribal nations across the country. Um, as you can see on this map, um, you know, that's a, a lot or 90% of the uh, uh, federally recognized persistent poverty counties are rural. Um, and that's something that uh, rural, the Rural Electrification Act was um, in part introduced to address. And of course, um, energy burden and energy bills are much uh, higher for rural households. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, the Southeast. Um, you know, you already have um, by and large um, because of kind of the uh, historic context that I've already mentioned, electric co-op member owners paying higher rates than their uh, neighbors who live in cities. Um, and we also, I, I imagine <laughs> this is a, a conversation in, in many parts of Iowa as it is here in many um, rural communities across Minnesota. Um, and this is certainly true in other parts of the country is that the housing stock, um, whether it's rental or whether um, it's uh, um, whether it's single family housing is really poor. Um, and uh, there's a there's a big need for greater energy efficiency um, in uh, in rural housing. So because of that, you have and because um, a, or rural people rural electric co-op member owners are generally paying higher rates and they're also living in less energy efficient homes. Um, energy burden is a, a much bigger factor in a lot of rural people's lives. The, uh, um, you know, all of the electric co-ops in the country, as I mentioned before, um, are organized under the seven cooperative principles. Um, I, you know, I was uh, want to uh, uh, spend, you know, a full hour actually talking about the uh, the cooperative movement and the Rochdale principles and uh, its impact on uh, particularly the upper Midwest. Um, if I can share just for a moment that the congressperson who wrote the Capper Bolstead Act, um, which legalized co-ops as a legal entity in the United States, is uh, from just down the road. Uh, from uh, Cure's uh, uh, office. Um, we like to think in particular um, in rural Minnesota, we have kind of a, a special tie to the cooperative movement. And so that's kind of what uh, with when we think about in rural Minnesota, our work on um, making sure that not just uh, electric co-ops are living up to their uh, original mission in improving the lives of rural people across the country, they're also living up to the democratic principles that they were founded upon, um, driven, of course, by um, the, uh, the cooperative movement that has done so much for rural communities across the Midwest. Um, but uh, as, uh, as I imagine many of you know, a lot of times um, electric co-ops and their leadership don't always live up to their democratic potential and don't always live up to their mission of improving the lives of rural communities and the communities that own them and that they serve. Um, generally, you'll have, um, uh, well, a lot of the membership, a vast majority of the leadership of, uh, of electric co-ops are um, uh, old white men, um, and this is particularly true uh, in, in those same persistent poverty counties um, where um, uh, in the Southeast. So you'll have uh, memberships that are um, over 90% uh, black members and the entire board will be made up of white men. Um, you have a lot of uh, issues across the country that you run into with, uh, kind of lack of integrity with elections. Um, there's a lot of horror stories, but it's a, it's a big problem that um, not that advocates like um, the Rural Power Coalition have been considering for uh, quite a long time. 
Uh, many of the folks that we talk with in the Southeast have been thinking about um, electric co-op democracy for uh, well over 40 years now. Um, but it, it's something that uh, is, you know, kind of always front and center in conversations of uh, how do we assure that co-ops are living up to their principles and also uh, delivering on the rural energy transition. Um, but, you know, as I've said, electric co-ops um, do have this historic mission um, that uh, you know, has successfully transformed rural communities across the country once before. Um, and uh, when we approach what needs to happen in order for um, rural communities and the United States to meet the necessity of addressing the, the climate emergency that you know, just last week the IPCC released a, a new report um, reminding us of the urgency. Um, we really have um, a lot of work to do. But the, the good news is, um, you know, we have roughly 14 years until uh, 2035 to meet the Biden administration's climate goals. Um, and just as a reminder, in 14 years, rural electric co-ops went from, you know, uh, nothing with 10% of the country of rural communities electrified to 80% of rural communities electrified. So we can do it. Rural electric co-ops have done it before. Um, it's just um, it's just driving um, these uh, institutions um, towards it through community action, through member owner advocacy, and through good um, federal public policy, which is you know, the priority of the Rural Power Coalition today. Um, so this is a, uh, um, a you know, there are barriers, of course, <laughs> to, to, this, uh, to this transition. And it, uh, you know, I think really encourages um, us to be as, as a coalition as, and as uh, uh, rural power advocates um, to approach this with some sense of urgency. Um, as you can see, this is a, uh, a graph showing um, the uh, you know, most carbon intensive utilities in the United States. If you look you know, on, on the top there, uh, nine out of the top 15 most carbon intensive utilities are generation and transmission electric co-ops, which are, uh, if you are not familiar with generation and transmission co-ops, um, that is, um, they're essentially co-ops of co-ops um, which own the generating assets, so the coal plants. So if you're a co-op member, um, uh, your like or your distribution co-op likely owns a, a distribution co-op or a generation and transmission co-op. So, like uh, Northern Iowa Power um, uh, would be a generation and transmission co-op um, that uh, would be somewhere on this list, actually. <laughs> um, 60 percent of the total power consumed by electric co-ops um, is coal, um, which makes uh, which makes electric co-ops, um, you know, uh, incredibly slow at adopting um, clean energy, um, much slower than their um, than their other utility counterparts. Um, so again, this is a part of kind of the the emergency and part of the urgency that uh, the Rural Power Coalition approaches this um, with. Um, we have uh, a very carbon intense um, sector or section of the utility sector that needs to be uh, transformed very quickly. And of course, there are there are reasons for uh, why co-ops have been um, slower to transition um, that I'll get to in a moment. Electric co-ops 
own a total of 57,000 megawatts of fossil fuel capacity, um, all of which need to be retired by 2035. Um, so again, it's a uh, it's going it's a monumental task that we uh, we need to accomplish here in a rather short period of time. Um, so this is a uh, just a screenshot of the um, the National Electric Co-ops Trade Association um, talking about um, you know how re how reliant on coal they are and. Uh, um, recognizing some of the uh, the barriers um, that uh, you know I think both the co-ops and us as advocates kind of have identified as uh, as things we need to surpass so um, one is the amount of debt that's associated with these uh, with these coal plants so, when we when we think about the, the history of rural electrification um, and uh, the bar the initial barriers of extending power lines to rural communities, um, that wouldn't have happened without major federal spending. Um, and in in a lot of cases, um, and if you look at kind of what has been articulated in previous um, House agriculture hearings on this topic. Um, in a lot of cases, the debt associated with this infrastructure isn't necessarily intended to ever be paid back. It was just a, a facilitation mechanism for deploying infrastructure. Um, however, um, because of that, Co-ops don't have other options to finance new investments. So co-ops who, again, already charge higher rates than uh, than their um, than other utilities, and serve ninety percent of the persistent poverty counties in the United States, um, have two options essentially to um, to fund new new infrastructure. They can either take out more debt, which will raise rates on member owners who, again, are more likely to be living with high energy burden or be living in a persistent poverty county, or they can raise rates, um, which, again, neither of those are particularly ideal. Um, I would say they are a, a, an incredible barrier um, to the clean energy transition. Co-ops have also not had the same kind of incentives that um, other utilities have had. So a big, big driver for new clean energy investment has been the production tax credit and the investment tax credit. Um, well, co-ops as nonprofit utilities don't have a tax appetite that they can write off as part of a tax credit. So those, uh, those incentives do nothing for them. Now, sure, a co-op can buy power from a third party vendor, uh, but that really goes against the entire kind of cooperative movement and cooperative project, which is um, building member equity versus um, uh, exporting member dollars outside of the organization. So essentially, the, the barrier to this is the, is the debt. Um, it's, the, uh, it's, it's tied to the original barrier uh, for rural electrification in the first place. Um, this is a, a slide that um, I would generally have my colleague, uh, Chris, from Mountain Association in Kentucky talk about. Um, but just to put this, this debt tied with the coal plants, with the infrastructure for co-ops in perspective. Um, Eastern Kentucky Power Co-op, which is a generation and transmission co-op that serves member owners in Kentucky, which again, remember that map uh, of persistent poverty counties. It's pretty, uh, pretty heavy in Eastern Kentucky. Um, every single day, uh, 
uh, half a million dollars is taken out of that community in just debt service alone to, um, to the $2.1 billion that Eastern Kentucky Power uh, has associated with its coal infrastructure. You can look at um, uh, us even closer to home uh, in uh, Minnesota, right? Um, not necessarily tied to the debt, so to speak. Uh, well, <laughs> in a way, um, but the, uh, the coal plant that Great River Energy, the generation and transmission co-op that serves roughly 20 to 30% of all Minnesotans lost $200 million in 2019. Um, which uh, also roughly translates out to about half a million dollars a day taken out of rural community or rural Minnesota communities to pay for a coal plant that is you know, tied to a lot of debt and of course is uh, increasingly uneconomic. So this is not just a barrier to the clean energy transition. Uh, it's also incredibly extractive to rural communities who have already been under decades of uh, duress as a result of disinvestment. Um, this uh, comes from an article covering the work of the Rural Power Coalition earlier this year, which essentially is uh, <laughs> uh, the National Rural Electric Co-op Association confirming everything I've said here. Um, just to read it out loud, there is debt out there, billions of dollars to build coal plants and not just the original debt, but debt to pay for emissions controls. We want to be able to service those debts. Fundamentally, we would want some sort of just and reasonable transition to a zero carbon economy that would deliver affordability and reliability to the communities we serve. So again, a lot of the debt that was out there for rural electrification in the first place. Um, still there. Uh, some of it has even been on the <laughs> on the books for uh, the entire time, uh, you know, since it was first taken out. So, um, what uh, what does the Rural Power Coalition want to uh, want to do about this? Um, so we got together. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic last year. And uh, we, as uh, seven organizations who have quite a bit of experience in working um, with electric co-ops, with electric co-op member owners, um, thought about what would a federal, pol what, what would federal policy, what would federal stimulus um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, look like and how could that um, both meet the immediate needs of member owners, um, rural people across the country, um, but also how could we address some of these long-term fundamental problems that uh, are really preventing the rural energy transition. And we came up with this um, seven point platform here um, which um, was joined by roughly, or uh, which was endorsed by roughly 100 um, organizations from around the country. Um, some of them rural organizations and rural advocates um, like Farm Aid um, and like the National Family Farm Coalition, but also some other kind of other organizations like uh, National Indivisible and uh, People's Action. Uh, we're really glad to say that a couple of these have already um, already passed in uh, uh, previous stimulus bills. Um, I think particularly we're glad that there was an uh, increase in the amount of funding to the low income uh, uh, energy assistance program. Um, we're also really glad that we're um, we're in alignment with the um, with the electric co-ops um, in advocating for um, making direct pay options available for those production tax credits and investment tax credits that co-ops haven't had access to that I mentioned previously. But I want to talk about the big ask. <laughs> um, 
our uh, proposal for uh, a major investment um, in the rural electric system that would allow for the retirement of all co-op fossil fuel power and reinvestment in the rural communities that the co-ops serve. Um, I, I should say, um, so first of all, why $100 billion? It's a huge number. Um, I'll explain that um, and then I'll go into further detail in a moment. But essentially um, on the books today uh, across the country, electric co-ops right now have $100 billion in debt um, on their books. Um, and that's for a system which you know I've already we've already gone over is incredibly fossil fuel intensive. Um, Sixty percent of uh, the power comes from coal still. Um, it's a more expensive, um, and uh, it is uh, not doing a lot of good things for the communities that they serve. Um, but that's that's where it is now, and we need to we need to entirely transform the rural energy system very, very quickly um, within 14 years, as I've said. Uh, so it stands to reason that um, a similar sized investment um, would be needed to entirely rework the, the rural energy infrastructure. And when we look at the, uh, the amount of money that has been uh, you know, directed into um, infrastructure improvements and stimulus bills, you know, it sounds like a big number, but when we're talking about a one-time payment to permanently transition the rural energy system, it doesn't sound so bad. So electric, or so the rural utility service, which is the um, modern rural electrification administration um, has two different types of uh, loan products. One is the treasury rate loans, which um, is uh, the, the program that holds roughly half of the $100 billion in existing rural electric co-op debt. The other 50% uh, is held by um, co-op banks. So there's co-bank and there's the uh, cooperative uh, or the <laughs> There's another cooperative uh, utilities bank, um, which are, are again, in large part, uh, relending uh, our US money. Um, and then there's a little bit that's held by um, kind of private banks as well. Um, but there is another type of loan product or product that the RUS um, operates called the hardship loan program. Um, and this, has not been appropriated to um, since the 1990s. So it's just a, a program that's been sitting on the shelf um, unused for, for quite a period of time. Um, so when we think about this existing program that sits out here um, and uh, is you know, called the hardship loan program, um, it can be activated as long as it has money to spend um, by the Secretary of Agriculture under the determination that um, a, uh, a electric co-op is enduring hardship. Well, I don't think that anyone would argue with you to say that uh, every single community in this country right now is enduring varying degrees of hardship. Um, so we, we feel um, that this uh, program that we would offer is very similar to what we just did um, with the Small Business Administration through the CARES Act. Um, and that's making uh, loans available through this hardship loan program that would be forgivable based on the cooperative meeting certain conditions. So just like last year, right? Congress put out almost a trillion dollars in federally insured loans um, through the Treasury Department for small businesses um, and small businesses, you know, had to meet X, Y, Z conditions, and those loans, um, in large part, were forgiven, and uh, you know, was a uh, a huge component of making sure um, the the economy um, didn't take more damage than it did 
and made sure that um, we didn't lose um, as many small businesses as we may have otherwise. But so we can use that exact same mechanism through the existing uh, RUS hardship loan program um, to deploy this money in rural communities um, in the public interest and uh, achieve the kind of carbon reductions we want, achieve the kind of rural development that we want, and achieve the kind of improvement in transparency and energy democracy that we want. Um, so, and we've put forward um, a set of uh, conditions that we feel would accomplish that in the, uh, would accomplish these goals that a lot of people um, who have been looking at electric co-ops over the last several decades have been thinking about um, would accomplish a lot of the different um, things that the Biden administration wants to accomplish in terms of climate, in terms of uh, economic and racial justice, and a variety of other concerns as well. And now keep in mind, um, through the CARES Act with the uh, small business and with the Small Business Administration loans, um, you know, we just spent uh, over a trillion dollars keeping the economy afloat. And I, you know, I think, I mean, we can, uh, we can discuss, uh, you know, how successful we think that was. I think it was the right thing to do, um, given the circumstances. And I think it was pretty successful um, at, uh, at its aims. But when we look at um, the, you know, spending roughly 10% of what we've already spent um, on rural utilities to permanently transition them off of fossil fuels. To me, that seems like a very logical um, and reasonable investment in rural communities. So um, over the last year, we've worked pretty closely with a number of leaders in Washington. Um, we have a uh, discussion draft bill um, that was crafted with a, uh, an allied um, office. Again, uh, roughly, well, at this point, over 120 organizations from around the country have endorsed this, uh, this concept. Um, and we're really glad to see the amount of discussion that it has um, uh, created um, with uh, leaders in Washington with other rural advocates around the country. Um, and uh, with the uh, Biden administration, we were really glad to see um, funding for uh, the co-op energy transition included in the rural fact sheet of the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan. Um, and then just last week, uh, we were really glad to see um, that it was included in the uh, um, budget resolution as a committee instruction to the agriculture committees. Um, so we, of course, um, we don't expect to, um, <laughs> we don't expect that uh, $100 billion will be the amount of money that, um, you know, uh, the Senate and the House and the administration end up negotiating to um, make available for a program um, such as this. Um, but we, we think that um, we think there's strong interest um, from both um, uh, Senate leadership and the administration to make a down payment on, on uh, the rural energy transition. Um, I actually um, am waiting right after this to continue our conversation with um, uh, the Senate Ag Committee. Um, so really looking forward to the evolving discussion over the next um, couple of months um, as we get closer and closer to a number and closer and closer to um, working some of the details of the proposal out. Um, so uh, what are we asking um, our friends and allies uh, from around the country to do? Well, right now we're asking um, people to continue helping, um, you know, raise the issue um, with uh, Senate and House leaders and with the administration. Um, 
and one of the ways that we're doing that is um, asking people to record quick little videos um, to post um, on social media and uh, send to their uh, representatives and senators. So I just wanted to play that, um, uh, play this video just as a demonstration. I'm hoping the, the sound comes through here. One second. <laughs> Is the sound coming through? Okay, shoot. Um, I forget how to do this every single time. Um, <laughs> okay, there we go. How about did you know that rural electric cooperatives serve 42 million Americans across 56% of the country's landmass? That includes rural, black, and brown communities, indigenous nations, and over 90% of federally recognized persistent poverty counties. For 75 years, they've been a critical piece of infrastructure for the communities they serve. And they're currently under serious pressure. If co-ops and rural communities are not adequately supported by the infrastructure bill, millions of Americans could suffer. And the opportunity to transition to renewable energy could be lost. That's why I'm joining the electric co-op member owners, the climate justice organizers, and the Rural Power Coalition. The demand that Congress support the rural energy transition by authorizing $100 billion for federally insured hardship loans. Rural Americans have been left out of the clean energy economy for too long. And now is the time to speak up. Find out more at www.ruralpower.us. Did you know that? Oh, I don't, we don't need to play that again. All right. Um, so if you would, uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen here. Um, but uh, if you're interested in, in helping us out there with uh, that uh, project um, in generating some videos, I'm gonna share our video toolkit um, in the chat here with you. Um, to uh, participate there. Um, so that is the, uh, the end of my uh, presentation here. Um, Happy to answer any questions that you all might have as best as I can. Um, um, but again, thank you so much for being here today. All right, thank you. We have a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, feel free to type questions in the chat, folks, or I think we have a few enough people that you can also just unmute and ask your question. Um, but I'm gonna start with Chuck's. What is the role of states in bringing attention to these issues and proposed remedies? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I think uh, I think once uh, a program like this is uh, is in place, um, it'll be really on um, states. It'll be on local communities and member owners to make sure that the co-ops have we have a really strong implementation. Because um, you know, we we want to we want to make sure that uh, new money made available is actually accomplishing the goals um, that we want to have happen. We want to um, you know, <laughs> do all of these things in the public interest. So you know, one of the things I think that, um, that states and local communities can do is to you know, uh, start talking to their uh, uh, leaders in, in the co-ops right now. Um, at, you know, if you're a member owner, uh, trying to show up to your um, your board meetings and just you know let them know that you you care enough to show up and um, uh, and ask questions or let them know you're paying attention. Um, you know I think I think states um, you know can can really do a lot in terms of uh, um, making sure that the co-ops are are responsive to to regulators. Um, I think uh, in well in. In most states, um, co-ops are really not, um, well, they're almost entirely uh, unregulated um, by state utilities commissions. And I, I think in, in large part that that does need to change, um, particularly because we have, you know, uh, such a large uh, scope of work to do 
even even if we you know in even if uh you know we were able to secure a hundred billion dollars for investment in rural utilities we would still need to have kind of a lot of people working really hard um for a solid implementation um so i i, I do think that is really important is that um you know member owners uh, and local communities start getting involved in their local co-op and telling their legislators uh, and utility commissioners that um, you know we we really need um, more oversight and making sure that um, you know things are happening in the public interest. So Joel has a question next, and then we'll go to Brian, and then we'll go back to Chuck's questions. Yeah, and I see Brian has his hand up. So, uh, you know, Eric, I just want to be cur curious too, um, you know, talking about some of this proposed piece. Um, you want to talk just a little bit too about how it could do a, a good job at rewarding uh, co-ops and, and, and GNTs as well, the, the transmission co-ops uh, who are doing a good job and how that can start to, uh, some of them are even you know, getting the ball rolling. And of course it takes some while if you have a lot of inertia behind the plants that you've made investments in. Um, so. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Well, so one of the, I, I, I probably didn't spend enough time kind of elaborating on kind of, you know, other parts of how the proposal works. I wanted to make sure we had enough time for questions, but it, you know, the, the idea is to provide this, you know, this amount of money to, uh, you know, achieve these goals and then the loans are forgiven. We essentially, the, the, the goal is to, you know, make money available essentially grants available to co-ops as long as they're doing X, Y, Z in the public interest. Um, so that's, you know, by getting the loans forgiven, um, that's what we really, that's how we see uh, rewarding them for accomplishing kind of all of the things we need to do um, in the public interest. Because, um, you know, when we look at, when we look at the, the clean energy payment plan, right? Um, if, I don't know how, how much, you all have looked at that yet, um, but essentially the way that's structured, um, co-ops are at a major disadvantage um, to to meet that um, to meet that policy um, because they're starting, you know, uh, a ways behind um, where uh, where their kind of comparable utilities are. Um, so I, I think you know even even to get them to a fair playing field with uh, your investor owned utilities of the world, we need this kind of major, uh, major investment um, in, in electric co-ops, even beyond, you know, um, the um, kind of the rewards and penalties that are being discussed in the clean energy payment plan. Um, so I, now, and again, I don't want that to be interpreted as me saying, I don't support the clean energy payment plan. I think it's, uh, I think it, it absolutely needs to happen, but, uh, we need to pay critical attention to where co-ops are um, right now as we develop that. So I, I think this, uh, you know, a, a program like the forgivable hardship loans, where we are making a massive investment available um, to be essentially written off um, as soon as, uh, you know, goals are accomplished, um, that is really important. Okay, great. Brian, did you still have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, Brian Cranbeer from My Energy Cooperative uh, in Rushford and Cresco. Uh, just a couple comments. Uh, one, we've uh, we've certainly followed uh, like the Cure Scorecard, and uh, I, I was pleased to say that that we did pretty good when you guys came out with that, and that uh, that My Energy is is certainly, I think. Uh, considerably better than uh, than some of the scenarios that uh, that uh, that you've laid out there. That we're uh, you know have a have a pretty diverse board of directors. With uh, we used to have three women on the board. Now we have just two because one moved to town. But also a, a diverse membership of of our directors that aren't typically agriculture. There's some professional people. Uh, for my energy, we also uh, are very engaged in solar is that we did not implement a grid access charge uh, in Minnesota when uh, when that was allowable. And we offer net metering uh, in Iowa. And uh, so I, I think we're we're one that uh, certainly works with our members and supports renewable energy. And I think we're pushing pretty close to 700 distributed generation systems uh, 
uh, on our system uh, as we speak. Uh, we're also really excited is that we're in the process right now of building four uh, three megawatt uh, solar arrays that, that we're actually going to be uh, doing uh, ourselves in addition to our generation and transmission co-op. So I, I'd like to say that we're we're doing all that we can and uh, and also our neighboring co-op, I think Holly is on here also, uh, we're also engaged in broadband. And, and I think that's the next revolution to, to really help uh, greater Iowa and, and greater America to, uh, to move the needle is uh, to deliver broadband. But uh, I, I think in, in regard to your proposal, uh, I'll say I wouldn't be opposed to it. That certainly was one of the challenges, uh, Eric, when uh, when we've seen tremendous amounts of load that was growing and people were adding all these electric appliances in the 50s and 60s, the federal government actually came to us and said, you can't use gas because we need to save gas for home heating. So we didn't have a choice. We had to look at capacity. And uh, I think that really is critical. Uh, I think the other thing that, that we wanna add to, to where you're going, Eric, that you know, if, if there are dollars to, to help us retire some, some older generation coal facilities, uh, we need some other resources. Hydro, in a lot of cases, is not classified as part of renewable energy. We think that it should be. And there's also some small nuclear stuff that, that we're very interested in, too, that, that, that could be an alternative. So uh, uh, I think it's a challenge. We're in an exciting time right now in, uh, in the electric industry and uh, appreciated your presentation, Eric. I just wanted to, to share a few thoughts from my energy. I appreciate that, Brian. You know, I think there are many co-ops across the country uh, like yours who are doing really innovative things. Um, and, you know, certainly doing everything that co-ops should be doing. Um, I, and I'm, I'm really excited to have, you know, so many good examples out there that we can point co-ops who have a ways to go um, to follow examples from. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, I, I should add as well that um, uh, NRECA is uh, coming into alignment with what we're, we're talking about. They think that this is, this might be a, uh, um, a way forward. We have, we do have some disagreements on uh, on carbon capture and a couple of other things, but I'm looking forward to uh, to working those out. That's for sure. So thanks for thanks for being here and thanks for uh, ongoing work um, in making the co-op sector as strong as it should be. How can ARP monies be deployed to pilot solutions? Well, that's a uh, that's a good question, and I'm not certain that uh, that I have a, a really solid answer for that. Sorry about that. That's okay. Are you working with the climate caucuses within the Minnesota legislature? Um, we do have, uh, you know, uh, conversations with uh, with them. How what we'd like to see moving forward. Um, you know, I I think they are. I think recently they've been pretty concerned about the direction that uh, Great River Energy has gone on um, with, uh, with Coal Creek. Um, I, I know that many of them have made that publicly known. Um, but so, you know, certainly, certainly, you know, certainly appreciate, um, you know, working with, uh, with legislators, um, you know, whatever um, place they're at, um, as long as they have their attention on co-op issues and rural issues. Um, but they're certainly, certainly folks we, we speak with on occasion. Thank you. All right, we got time for a couple more questions. Anyone else? Well, Heidi, I'll chime in to say, well, people are maybe thinking of some to, to text or to uh, say to us on, on the phone, but uh, our speaker next month, as you mentioned at the beginning of the hour, will be Holly McCormick from LFB Key Clayton REC. And so it would be great to hear what kind of things they're working on on the local side of things as well. And um, maybe we'll get Brian to come back uh, in a couple months and, and tell us, especially about those uh, exciting um, uh, pro, pro, uh, solar that's gonna be installed uh, near the local substations, uh, especially in some Minnesota counties, so. Hi, Joel, this is Holly and I can't get my video to work. 
But yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to visiting. And I just do have a quick comment. Um, I agree with everything Brian says. And I feel like us co-ops, we really, we really know that this is the direction that our nation needs to move. However, we are always very concerned with reliability for our members too. You know, we have to have a plan that, um, you know, continues to give us reliability. I look at what happened in Texas and, you know, that's really a scary thing with some of these extreme weather, weather patterns and make sure that, you know, you can keep the power on and have the appropriate infrastructure when you do increase your renewables so that you can transport it where it needs to go. And obviously I think most people are aware that our, our grid needs some major modernizations too. So that's just another concern I have that's constantly top of mind when I know that we're looking at um, adding more and more renewables, which is the right thing to do, but I just don't want people to lose sight of the fact that we have to be able to also transport these renewables to population centers as well as sparsely populated areas. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, transmission and, uh, and a modernized grid is absolutely critical um, for, you know, the success of uh, the rural energy transition. And I, I, I guess I, I haven't uh, shared the, the full text of our, our draft bill just because it hasn't been introduced yet. But I, I just want to assure you, Holly, that uh, that is addressed um, uh, pretty extensively. All right. If anyone else have, a, have other questions, feel free to unmute or type. And if not, we'll wrap up a little bit early here. I'm going to duck off my stuff to my next one. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much, Eric, for your presentation. Oh, wait, you're on mute. Oh, well, thanks, everyone, for showing up today. Thanks for having me. Um, would uh, love to have your support and help. Uh, if you'd want to make a video, uh, check out the link that I have in the chat. Um, and uh, that should be able to. Uh, help you out and uh, do what you need to do. But if you're interested in that, really appreciate it. But thanks again. Thanks all. And I'll send out this link if anybody needs it. I'll send it out to all the participants.